development. So really my talk today is in three parts. I'm going to sort of set the scene in terms of the motivation for trying to do these studies, tell you a little bit about the data that we've been gathering and then finally give you a case study which shows how we've interacted with um, a pharmaceutical company to test some of their novel compounds in human brain slices and some of the very interesting results that have come out of that. So of course, thank you to the various people that have funded the research. I think it's fair to say that the pharmaceutical industry is at a bit of a crossroads at the minute. And we all know that there have been a number of major um, uh, companies that have um, essentially left uh, the arena. Um, I won't go into naming any names. Um, but that's due to probably a mixture of shrinking pipelines, um, a lot of big uh, blockbusters coming off patent. Um, and um, Fred uh, from GSK um, sort of set the scene for me quite nicely earlier on when he showed some of the an analysis that's been done. And there's many reasons for this. And I think it's well encapsulated. The difficulties of working um, in this space are encapsulated by E-Room's Law of Pharma R&D. And any of you, the keen eyed amongst you will notice that this is a, a reverse of Moore's Law. So you can see that, um, I'll just get my pointer here. Uh, that um, in terms of new drug approvals, we're not really going anywhere, but the amount of money that's being spent is uh, increasing exponentially. And um, there are a number of reasons for the failure in drug development, and one of them uh, that is probably the main one remains this lack of efficacy. So in the 90s, it was unpredictable PK that was the main reason for failure. In the early uh, noughties, it was the lack of uh, efficacy. Um, and in still um, up to 2007, this lack of efficacy remained the main reason uh, for failure. So I'm going to be uh, slightly bold or controversial and uh, say that the current model of preclinical R&D is fundamentally flawed. Um, and I might have to do a very quick exit uh, later, later on. Uh, so we're currently working um, in an in a, in a arena like this where um, essentially we have uh, target identification um, in preclinical animals, target validation through the lead optimization and then clinical development. It's only here that we, we enter the, um, the human arena. And what I would suggest is that really what we need to be doing is we need to get the human uh, involved as early on as possible. And a, a number of companies are, are doing that. So you can use, for example, transcriptomics, um, proteonomics, uh, localization, uh, biochemistry, and, and to some degree pharmacology. But what you can't do, uh, or at least can't do very well, is understand something about physiology, and certainly from the, from the point of view of the central nervous system. So you can get post-mortem brain tissue or fresh brain tissue that allows you to do a number of these, but really we don't know a lot about the physiology. So using that as a motivation, and motivated by this quote here from Norbert Weiner, which is, the best material model for a cat is another cat, or preferably the same cat, so just replace human uh, with cat, we decided to try and set out and understand something about the physiology of the microcircuits in the, in the human uh, neocortex. So what we've been trying to do is understand what the mechanistic underpinnings of network oscillations uh, are in the human neocortex. And again, various people today, Chris, Peter, have, have set me up perfectly, so they've done all the heavy lifting for me. You all know that these neuronal network oscillations are generated by local cortical microcircuits, that we have specific frequency bands, and I'm going to focus again on these gamma frequency oscillations, have distinct network mechanisms. There's a high degree of heterogeneity in terms of the microcircuits that are involved in the production of these discrete frequency ranges. But at present, we really don't have the degree of invasiveness that allows us to assess the, the mechanistic features uh, of these oscillation, uh, oscillations. Animal models have proved productive, but um, are they reliable? Um, and so what we've tried to do in Newcastle is utilize live human cortical tissue to assess the contribution and specifically looking at the GABAergic mechanisms uh, with respect to human neocortical network oscillations. Now what's our current understanding of these cortical gamma frequency oscillations? And Peter and Chris have already gone over some of this, but we have this sort of canonical microcircuit which consists of a fast spiking interneuron, parvalbumin containing interneuron, which provides this very dense perisomatic innervation of large ensembles of pyramidal cells. And um, what we know is that these uh, fast spiking interneurons um, uh, receive phasic uh, um, and tonic synaptic input in the form of glutamatergic drive. And that then in turn means that they have a phasic output, so they, they spike on every cycle um, of the gamma period. 
And then in turn, that means that the postsynaptic targets of these fast spiking interneurons are essentially being bombarded with these phasic gamma frequency IPSPs, inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, onto the principal cells. And it's really this phasic um, gamma frequency uh, bombardment of these IP IPSPs which sets up the local field potential which we can record and which underlies the electroencephalogram. Now, of course, there are a number of variations on this schematic, but um, this is um, the experimental model that we have derived from uh, various uh, animal uh, work. So what we've tried to do is essentially try and use the techniques that we've developed um, in uh, rodent brain slices. So that's generally speaking using um, extracellular recording techniques. So a single extracellular uh, electrode which allows us to record the LFP. So one way to think about that is the micro EEG. And at the same time then we can also poke um, individual neurons using um, sharp microelectrodes, so using intracellular techniques, and that then allows us to understand something about the intrinsic and synaptic conductances um, that relate to the network activity that we're recording at the same time. The other um, great thing about this approach is that you can also uh, fill the neuron that you're recording with with a dye, so biocytin, so you get an anatomical idea of the cell that you're recording from. So this is a layer three human pyramidal neuron, beautiful structure and lovely sort of uh, axons that come out from the base here and extend up to very large distances within the cortical slice that we've recorded from. Now, another um, methodological point that I should make here um, is to, to point out how do we actually get this tissue. So um, when we first initiated this project, we were looking primarily at obtaining epileptic tissue. And of course, that type of tissue is routinely removed in patients that are undergoing elective neurosurgery for drug-resistant epilepsy. We quickly realized that we needed non-epileptic comparison tissue. And one of the surgeons suggested that uh, in some operations, when they have to get access to a deep brain tumor, they debulk overlying cortex to get access to that tumor. And so it's that debulked overlying cortex that we use as our sort of non-epileptic comparison tissue. So it can be um, considered as, as close to, uh, to normal as possible. So um, using this tissue and using this, these techniques, we asked a very simple question, which was, Knowing um, that we can pharmacologically um, manipulate um, slices into uh, generating this synchronous network activity, does this same model that we've has been well circumscribed in rodent tissue work in the human neocortex? So we apply very small concentrations of canic acid, um, as Stan alluded to earlier in his talk, and you can see that you clearly get the, uh, the, the, the synchronous rhythmic activity, which is in the gamma frequency peak when you take these recordings and then apply uh, an FFT to uh, these recordings. And what we see is that when we record across uh, the cortical layers is that most of this gamma seems to be emanating from um, the superficial layers, so it's a large amplitude in layer 2-3, but it's present throughout the layers right down into um, layer 6. And the frequency of the activity is consistent across all layers. So with that, we then wanted to understand something about what was going on at the cellular level. So again, we were able to carry out uh, concurrent uh, LFP and intracellular recordings. So this is the local field potential, the persistent gamma rhythm that we've recorded. This is in human temporal neocortex. And we can record from uh, what looks like a regular spiking pyramidal cell in layer three. Here's the biocyte and reconstruction. We see that this neuron fires sparsely during the ongoing gamma. So that fits with the uh, previous findings from uh, rodent studies. But that, it, um, again, uh, it uh, is receiving this constant barrage of gamma frequency IPSPs as revealed when we depolarize the cell to minus 20 millivolts. And you can see that it's also receiving um, excitatory postsynaptic potentials when you um, hyperpolarize the cell to minus 70 millivolts. So, so far this looks very similar to what we've seen um, in rodent gamma. Um, we can also look at the um, temporal pattern of the inhibitory drive onto these principal neurons. So there is this noticeable phase shift that we see when you record um, in, uh, across layer two and layer three. So this is a LFP recording in layer two and an LFP recording in layer three. And when you do a cross correlation of these signals, you can see that there's a 180 degree phase shift. And really, um, this uh, arises due to a current sink source phenomenon because when you look at the um, inhibitory drive that these cells receive on either side of this phase shift, 
there is no difference in terms of the temporal pattern of this activity. So, so far it looks very similar to uh, rodent neocortical gamma um, and we quickly realized that we needed to do more detailed types of recordings that really we were limiting the amount of data that we were able to obtain with the single extracellular uh, and single intracellular recording technique. So we de decided to use multi-electrode array technology and what we've done is we've adapted the Utah uh, MEAs to be able to record in these human brain slices. So this just gives you an idea of the schematic. Here's our recording chamber with the human brain slice sitting in it, being constantly perfused with um, ACSF and kept at physiological tempers. And uh, we drop the probe down into it. This is um, a post hoc um, immu uh, immunocytochemical stain. Uh, and you can, each of these red dots denotes where uh, a tip of the electrode has been um, implanted within the slice. So you get very good coverage um, of, the, uh, of all the layers across the slice. And you can then um, generate, for example, heat maps of the particular type of oscillation that you're interested in and correlate that with the underlying anatomy when you do the post hoc um, staining. So this is quite a, a powerful technique. It allows us to then look at some of the spatial features of this activity. And um, what we can uh, demonstrate here is that if you look um, using these Utah arrays in rodent brain slices and in human brain slices, that again, it would seem that both in rodent and human neocortex, the gamma oscillations arise from the superficial layers. So most of this activity seems to be uh, coming from layer two, layer three. Um, using this ability to combine the multi-electrode arrays with um, post-talk uh, immuno, we then stained the slices for parvalbumin, which we know to be this critical fast-breaking interneuron that's important for generating this persistent rhythmic activity. And what we've then done is we've then done um, a connectivity network, which is shown here. Now, this is generated by calculating pairwise cross-correlations at a zero time lag. Um, and you can see that the, um, the size of the blue dot indicates the area power, and then the uh, presence of a line shows that there is a cross the, there is a, a strength in terms of a significant strength in terms of the cross correlation that takes place between neighboring electrodes. So what you should be able to see is that where you have this dense um, uh, network of parvalbumin cells, that the uh, the connected network of gamma uh, lies perfectly on top of that. And you can then take a single row of electrodes at any point within this and do current sense, uh, a CSD analysis, so current sink source density uh, analysis, and see again that there is this sink source phenomenon which is occurring across the um, superficial layers. So um, all of this would point again to the, point, uh, the, the fact that inhibitory networks are critical for generating this activity. And indeed, if you record from a fast spiking uh, interneuron in layer three of the human neocortex, you can see that in contrast to recording from a pyramidal cell, you have this very high frequency output. So this is um, this cell, this a fast spiking interneuron is firing at gamma frequencies and is tightly coupled to the extracellular gamma that we've recorded in the extracellular electrode. So we can see this both intracellularly, but also um, analyzing single units that we've recorded from with our multi-electrode array. So here's an example of a couple um, of uh, um, uh, units that we've pulled out, which we believe to be putative interneurons, and then the rest of these cells are likely to be putative pyramidal cells. The other um, piece of evidence, which again supports this idea of inhibition playing a critical role, is if you do a simple pharmacological manipulation where you block postsynaptic GABA A receptors with bicuculin or um, gabazine. And what you can see that is in both the rat and the human that you get this complete um, uh, abolition of the gamma frequency oscillations. So I'm going to sort of summarize the first part of the talk and um, hopefully what I've been able to demonstrate is that human neocortical persistent gamma oscillations are at least superficially similar to rodent models uh, in terms of inhibition-based network rhythms. There's sparse firing of pyramidal neurons during the human gamma, and the rhythm is sensitive to GABAergic um, antagonism. Now, there are some <coughs> subtle differences, which I don't have the time to go into today, um, but I can discuss afterwards if anybody would like to talk about that, between human and gamma oscillations. And we believe that they, these differences may arise due to an adaptation of the human brain to essentially deal with the larger distances that it has to operate over in terms of the ability to synchronize gamma rhythms over longer distances. So for the next part of the talk, I really want to ask, given that we've now 
proven that we can generate this activity in human brain slices in vitro, can we use it to test the efficacy of novel pharmacological compounds? And um, the case study that I want to present really is a novel target for the treatment of schizophrenia. And um, we've been working with Autiphany um, Therapeutics, um, which is uh, a company that's headed by Charles Large. Um, and they've been very interested in, they've got a very strong program where they've been very interested in um, another type of potassium channel, not, not the TAS channel. This is a KV3.1, which is highly expressed in the neocortex um, and is strongly expressed in these parvalbumin-containing um, interneurons, but it's also expressed in other interesting pathways that have been implicated in the pathophysiology of schizophrenia, such as the VTA. Um, and this is the schematic, um, which I've slightly modified from um, Lisman et al. in 2008, and that we have these GABAergic fast-breaking interneurons, which, are, um, which have this high expression, selective expression of KV3 channels. Um, we know that this interaction between the pyramidal cells and then the NMDA drive, which Peter alluded to uh, earlier on, is critical in terms of the pathophysiology for schizophrenia. Um, and um, there's been, oh, sorry, uh, this slide, it's not come out the way I wanted it to. Um, oh, this, this is um, some uh, data from uh, the company which has demonstrated that when you do wholesale patch clamp recordings, you can see that if you look at the frequency of the action potentials that are generated by these fast baking interneurons, that um, when you um, reduce the output with a, with a, a blocker such as TEA, that uh, the compound, so this is one of the, the compounds that they've produced to positively modulate these KV3 channels can then rescue uh, that um, reduction in the um, frequency of the output of these fast breaking interneurons. We know also that there are altered levels of KV3.1 in patients with schizophrenia and this is data from Carol Tominga's group where they looked at KV3, uh, B, sorry, KV3.1 protein levels um, in post-mortem uh, brains. So these were found to be decreased in post-mortem tissue from off-drug uh, but not on-drug patients in the prefrontal cortex. And the KV3.2 protein was unchanged in patient tissue in any brain region and was unaffected by chronic medi uh, medication. And this, this paper summarizes these results that came out a number of years ago. So what we've tried to ask now is whether we can use this human in vitro platform um, that we use to examine neocortical rhythmogenesis to test um, this novel compound in terms of its ability to alter gamma frequency oscillations in the human brain. So here's our slice. Um, as you know, we're providing this um, sort of ex this broad excitation to the network, which allows us to record the gamma frequency LFP, and that's due to this interaction between these um, fast spiking interneurons and these uh, sparsely firing pyramidal cells. Um, and this um, can, we know that this translates to, to the level of the whole brain. And indeed, there's a lot of work now that demonstrates, for example, that these neocortical gamma frequency oscillations are disrupted in patients with schizophrenia. So is this a good translational biomarker system to evaluate the efficacy of these novel therapies? So here's the data. Um, so this is... Um, what we're um, trying to suggest, that there's some form of dysfunction of NMDA drive onto um, the GABAergic fast spiking interneurons. Um, so this is uh, real data here from, from rodent recordings, intracellular rodent recordings, where we know that if you pharmacologically block these NMDA receptors, you decrease the output of these fast spiking interneurons. And the idea is that with the uh, positive modulation of the KV3 channel, uh, will, which will increase um, the repolarization uh, of the action potentials in the fast breaking interneuron, you may then boost the firing or the synchrony of the firing in those fast breaking interneurons. So what we've done is, in our human brain slices, we've essentially given them an insult which mimics schizophrenia. So we've got them oscillating with canate, and then we've put PCP on on top, or we can use ketamine, um, to mimic this NMDA hypofunction uh, model. And then we add the compound OT6 at 10 micromolar. And this is the data here. So this is um, a summary of the data. What you can see is that we, here we have the percentage change in gamma power. We have our baseline. Uh, and this is in an experiment where we just have cane it. You can see that the addition of OT6 does nothing to the gamma frequency oscillation. But when you insult the cane oscillation with PCP, you now see that the 
OT6 compound can boost the gamma frequency oscillation. And of course, the other um, uh, great thing about this approach is that we can take the slices that we've done these experiments in and then show post hoc that we have PV positive interneurons and that there are also KV 3.1 uh, channels uh, ex uh, expressed in the tissue as well and that we've got a good overlap in terms of the expression um, of those channels. Now, um, I want to also uh, give you some very exciting data which is literally hot off the plate in that we were lucky enough to get tissue from a gentleman, a 59 year old male, who had, um, he had a, a frontal brain tumour but it also turned out that he was a chronic schizophrenic patient and we thought, wow, this is a really exciting opportunity here. So in order to gain access to the tumour, the um, surgeons had to debulk the uh, overlying superior frontal gyrus and that's the bit of tissue that we got. So what we've done here is that we haven't had to do the PCP insult we've, because hopefully his tissue should be schizophrenic. Um, and when we've added OT6, uh, we see that it boosts the gamma frequency oscillation and here's the power spectrum to show you control in black and red OT6 um, at a similar concentration to what we've used previously. So this is quite exciting data. We're, we've got a number of recordings from the sample and we're trying to analyze that now to get an overall picture. So I hope what I've been able to do is demonstrate that um, this is a very um, uh, novel and productive way of looking at um, compounds that could be useful for, uh, for um, neuropsychiatric and diseases and how they may uh, be efficacious in terms of modifying human neocortical circuit activity um, and that um, future work will now aim on demonstrating the cellular mechanisms that underlie this augmentation of network function. So we've been able to do target compound investigation on rhythms of cognitive relevance um, in human neocortical tissue. And I'll just finish by acknowledging the various people who've contributed to this work both in Newcastle and colleagues in York um, at IBM and at Tiffany Therapeutics. And thank you for your attention. You yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that, that's one of the difficulties that you're very much beholden to what you get. And so we've been doing this now for about <coughs> six or seven years and what we've tried to do is essentially keep very good records of where we get the tissue from. You then just build up a portfolio and you are essentially trying to, you know, make sure that you've got enough ends in terms of the areas that you're recording from. Broadly speaking, most of the samples we get are either from frontal lobe or from the temporal lobe. So, I, so what I haven't shown there is what happens when you have a canid oscillation and then you put PCP on, on top. So we're, we're doing those experiments at the minute um, to, to show. I mean, it looks like PCP seems to be decreasing the gamma um, and then, and then the, the OT is basically boosting that. It's an acute application, yeah. I mean, we wash it on uh, for somewhere in the region of an hour, 60 minutes. What I've shown here is just when we have both the KNIT and the PCP on, and that's, uh, sorry, that's um, when you then add OT, that's in the red line. So that's the KNIT PCP plus OT, whereas KNIT only, um, so you've just got a KNIT induced oscillation, you haven't hit it with PCP, but when you add OT, it doesn't do anything to it. Yeah, sorry, so I just didn't understand why in the first 30 minutes the, the red and the black were effectively the same. Well, it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's normalised. It's normalised. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So we know that, you, as you rightly say, that particularly, uh, for example, these KV3 channels are highly expressed in the auditory pathway and people have shown that noise exposure can change the phosphorylation state. We don't know what this, their phosphorylation state is in terms of uh, our recordings, but I think it'd be something very interesting to have a look at. So I can show you data that supports that to some degree. So uh, what we've sorry, uh, what we've done is we've done a preclinical animal model. So um, what we do first of all is that the the animals, the rats, are chronically treated with PCP, and on the top here is a confirmation of the cognitive deficit using the novel object memory test. We then take slices from those animals and so then this is the uh, data from the slices where uh, these are recordings in prefrontal cortical slices from PCP rats and as you can see here um, this is uh, the oscillation induced by carbocol canate um, and then when you add odd you basically augment the oscillation. In the sham animals odd doesn't do anything at all. <laughs>